We had uh, BA Team 1 and BA Team 2, um, Firefighter Vet and myself of BA Team 2. We set up a high-rise pack and an attack and lay pack. Our initial tasking was to go with uh, BA Team 1 up to the fire floor, um, attach um, to, the, uh, to the hydrant in the stairwell and uh, make entry to the unit, basically do a primary search um, of, of that unit. As soon as we opened the, the doorway to the hallway, visibility was zero. It was um, quite thick, it was ceiling to floor, it was very, very thick and you could feel the heat. So BA Team 1 made entry, uh, went through the door, turned right. Uh, as we deduced that's where the unit was from the ground floor, having a look before we went in. And by that time BA Team 3 had arrived from Roma Street and Ross went with BA Team 1 and I was sitting in the hallway hauling hose for those guys and the, the BA Team 3 from Roma Street. They took the high-rise pack that we had set up and they went through the doorway and went left to do um, search and rescue. We had a, a thermal imaging camera which worked perfectly at the start of shift and all the way up the stairwell as soon as we got into the fire floor decided it wasn't going to work anymore so we were basically blind because um, visibility was zero as soon as we entered the fire floor. In the early stages uh, communications plan just started off basically with our fire ground channel and I maintained all communications to Firecom. I was approached by Station Officer Christian Carell who was the officer in charge of 501 Tango, our command and control unit. He asked where I wanted uh, control established. We chose a location where at that time it was free of smoke, it was a high vantage point where we could get a good, uh, a good view on the structure. They gave me a point or an aspect to see two sides of the structure and, uh, and also um, we were hoping to get um, the best communications that we could from the top of Ann Street and, and Gotha Street. That communications plan we found later to be ideal to fall back to. We did um, suffer from some communication issues in regards to radio traffic and um, competition with uh, telephone networks uh, with every other end user that was within the CBD area of uh, Fortitude Valley in Brisbane. We came off um, up Gotha Street, turned up Gotha Street, it's fairly steep and immediately met by Station off some more. He, uh, he directed us where he wanted us parked or where, where he wanted water put onto, and now uh, he left it up to us to, to work out the best way to do that. We ended up going up and swinging a, a big Yui up onto Ann Street, come back out and reverse back in between what, what I would die to find as the Alpha side. Um, there was a gap between the main entry building and the building where the fire was located, and from there we determined that we'd be able to put water at least onto the unit that was on fire, if not the, the roof the roof space as well. By the time we'd, we'd set up the truck and started to um, get it into action, it seemed to change a little bit and uh, smoke started sort of come, just spotted it coming out of the eaves on the alpha side, away from where the fire was, so it sort of changed our intentions a bit. We needed, we were yelling to the people, there's the people up on the balcony on this side, on the corner, got the side corner and they started to panic a little bit at this stage because uh, when we got there, we told them to get down, they didn't pay attention to us, they were on the source. And I that was quite clear. And uh, in, say, the 10 minutes, we put the, put the chocks down, started to get the truck up, their, their egress was blocked. You could tell that straight away. So it, uh, our priorities changed to our rescue situation. At this time, uh, I was surprised to hear the, uh, the screams and, and, uh, and a cry for help from above. Uh, we had an occupant of one of the units um, who was stuck on their balcony on the top floor, which was our fire floor. Um, I asked him to retreat back into his unit, knowing full well that the unit would be the safest place for him. He would be out of smoke and it was a compartment and I prioritised the course of action to ensure we got crews to him immediately. Uh, within 30 seconds I had crossed the road, looked back up and there were now three people on that said balcony. Um, I was told by the occupant, uh, the male, that the unit had filled up with smoke and that it was unsafe for them to be inside. Uh, Station Officer Grant Gaskin tasked a firefighter from below on Gotha Street to put a hose line over these uh, people on this balcony to entrain some clear oxygen uh, to give them a breathable space until we could get people to their location. The people on the balcony, they were fairly panicked. Um, There's a bit about a 10 minute gap there from when we got there to when we were sort of making our way there and 
by this stage, the, the smoke was billowing out the balcony from their doorway. Uh, I told them to shut the door, they didn't do that. So just coming out their, the door of their unit and coming over their heads, they were getting pretty hot. Uh, grab a case of one, just put it up on there just to, a bit of encouragement to, to, to them, for them to wait. Peace of mind for them that we're coming and they also had to cool them down a bit. We were able to get a pretty good stream up there and, uh, and direct the smoke away from them a little bit too. Just, yeah, just calm them down mostly. Because I think they were starting to look for trees and they, they, I believe they said that afterwards. Best tree to jump in, so it calmed them down. We told them to get down, cool them down a bit and uh, they held on until we got there. Heavily smoke logged, extremely noisy. You were yelling, standing face to face with your partner, yelling, and they could only just hear you. We supported BA Team 1 down to the, um, to the fire affected unit. When we first entered, it was, there was fire everywhere. Every, everything was on fire in that room. We had no radio communications at all. You could not get the volume high enough for the bone density mic to actually be working properly with the radio and then the distortion was incredible. You just couldn't make out and then they couldn't hear what we were saying. We did have trouble communicating by radio so we went back to tapping on the back and yelling through BA masks to communicate. Despite that issue, the understanding was clear with everyone what had to, had to be done. At one stage we, um, we needed more hose or team, BA Team 1 needed more hose. I, I had my partner who was um, at the door, I said to him, I need to go and drag more hose. Uh, and it's the first time in 17 years in the job where I've physically had to pick up the hose and follow it back to the door because he's like, very disorientated by the time you turn around and bang on different doors to know where, where you were. We had to physically, I had to physically pick up the hose and follow it back and as soon as I got to the stairwell door, I knew where I was. I've never had to do that before, apart from training. BO Team 1 and BO Team 2 exited at the same time. We came down. We met uh, an another two crews, I think, coming up the stairwell. We told them what, what we'd done, we'd, where we'd left our hoses, we'd put our branches back to the door. Um, by this stage, uh, when we got to the bottom of the stairwell, the, the door was propped open, there was a positive pressure fan there. As we came down the stairwell, there'd been um, a couple of PPVs set up. There was the electric blowhard in the stairwell, um, and that was keeping that pressurised, and that was working really well. And obviously the effect of that in the hallway was starting to work as well. And then as we got down the foyer, there was another PPV down down there, um, pressurising that stairwell from the bottom and uh, yeah, the ventilation there worked. At that stage uh, when we were uh, replenishing our sets I looked up at the corner of the building, the Ann Street, Gotham Street corner and you can see the smoke pulsing out from the uh, from the surface of the, of the building and it, it didn't quite look right. Firefighter vet did was pointing out to me about the 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 roof line that there was. It looked like it had penetrated into the roof, and um, we were discussing how it, it seemed like it was travelling through the roof. By that stage, I sort of thought, oh, well, this might not be what I thought it was initially. We were retasked um, to go uh, back up to the fire floor. We came back out to the fire floor. And at that stage, the ceiling was starting to break through, um, starting to fall in places. You could see flame up above your head. And uh, that's when I knew that there was no compartmentation. Um, you could see the rafters. But there was a giant manhole there. We pushed that up. Um, and as soon as we lifted a tiny bit, we could see that the, there was a lot of uh, fairly heavy fire activity in the uh, roof void. At one stage we had three lines up into that uh, manhole at different different areas um, and you can see that uh, when we put our head up and had a look you could see just about the whole 
of the, uh, the area of the building, just full of uh, timber rafters and uh, insulation and stuff like that. It was, it was going, it was absolutely humming on. Our hose lines were making absolutely no difference. We put so much water on that into that ceiling void, but it had already gone over the top of us and it was already over the other side, over the Ann Street, Gothel Street corner. By the time we'd got back up to our second wear, 